What comes to mind when you hear the word teacher? This time of year, you may be thinking about those poor, worn out school teachers who are much more than the children counting down the days to the summer break. In this setting, you may think about a Bible class teacher or one who fills the pulpit and teaches in a very formal way. But I think we all recognize that teachers take different forms. Sometimes a teacher can be what we might call a formal teacher who lead a classroom with a study guide. But teachers take all shapes and sizes. Whether we're talking about teaching in a classroom, whether we're talking about teaching in a dining room, sitting across the table with the Bibles open, whether talk about teaching through gentle words and sometimes stern admonition just in the hallways of the church building. Or sometimes we talk about teaching as modeling our lives, as examples in teaching others. In the book of Titus chapter 2, the Apostle Paul to the young evangelist Titus gave him some instructions as a teacher in how he was to help others who were also teachers. Look with me in Titus chapter 2 and in verse 1. He says, but as for you, speak, the, speak things which are proper for sound doctrine, that the older men may be sober reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, in patience, the older women likewise, that they may be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. This morning I'd like to zero in upon that phrase, teachers of good things. And in this context, he's talking to one class of people, to the older men and to the older women. He says, Titus, instruct them to be teachers teachers of good things. And so this morning I'd like to talk to and about the old people. Two th things, first of all. Number one is, I don't mean that word old in a negative, insulting way at all. I think it should be worn as a badge of honor. And secondly, I dare not say who fits into that category. You decide yourself. But in this context, he talks about the older men and the older women, that they are both to be instructors, to be teachers. And this morning, I want to talk to you about three things that I've learned from old people. One thing that I've learned from those that are to be teachers of good is that I've learned that happiness is a choice. Turn with me, if we will, to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 12 in your Old Testament. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Just start there in the first verse in just a little bit. <clears throat> you know, older people have a lot to complain about. They usually have more sickness than younger people. They typically have more aches and pains. They certainly have more doctor's appointments. My dad said when he was still alive that he had to retire to free up time for doctor's appointments. They usually have a whole lot to complain about, but... I've found in my experience that some of the happiest people I've ever known are the elderly. 
Look with me in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 12. And we're going to get this out of the way because I don't mean this necessarily to depress you this morning if you're old or if you're on the precipice of being old. But the wise man describes the difficulties of older age and starts with this encouragement, Ecclesiastes 12 verse 1, Remember now your Creator in the days of your youth before the difficult days come. And the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. While the sun and the light, the moon and the stars are not darkened. He's going to use some metaphors here or some similes to, to describe the difficulties of old age. The sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened. That's probably talking about just illnesses and the difficulties that, that generally darken what would otherwise be bright days. And the clouds do not return after the rain. Or speaking of the old age, clouds return after the rain. What that seems to indicate is, is that you get over one thing just in time for something else to come. One storm passes by and you think, ooh, I'm glad that's over with. And then what's that on the horizon? Another storm of illness coming. In the day when the keepers of the house tremble, verse 3. We don't need much help understanding that one. Probably the hands that began to tremble many times with old age. And the strong men bow down. When the grinders cease because they are few. That's probably talking about the teeth. And those that look through the windows, the eyes, those that look through the windows grow dim. When the doors are shut in the streets and the sound of the grinding is low, maybe talking about the, the difficulties of the lips and the mouth. Can you relate to this one? When one rises up at the sound of a bird, the difficulty to sleep. One amazing thing about old age is, is that even sleep becomes hard to do. And when they're afraid of height and the terrors in the way, when the almond tree blossoms, probably the white hair, and the grasshopper, probably speaking of the feet and the legs, when the grasshopper is a burden and the desire fails, for man goes to his eternal home and the mourners go about in the street. The wise man here in very poetic form describes the difficulties and the travails of old age. But again, my experience has been that some of the happiest people that I know are people that are going through every one of these things. And so they've taught me, as they were instructed to do, they have been teachers of good things because they've taught me that happiness is a choice. That happiness is not something that can be mine based upon solely the circumstances of life. They've taught me that I can be happy when times are tough and when pain is a daily struggle. You know, I love being around people. I love being around older people who maintain a positive outlook on life, who will admit the difficulties that they have, who will mention their pains and aches because they can't help it but yet they still have a good sense of humor, have a good view of life, and who realize that despite their difficulties, they are still very blessed by God. Turn back a little bit earlier in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 12 I think many or most old people that I've come in contact with understand this premise, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, in talking about the general vainness and futility of life. He says, here's how we should approach life. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 12, For I know that there is nothing better for them, that's the workers or laborers in this life, that there's nothing better for them than to rejoice and to do good in their lives. The Revised Standard Version translates it this way, that there's nothing better for them to rejoice and enjoy themselves in their lives. 
and also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. They've learned and they've taught me to learn that the things of this life are to be enjoyed. We do not look at the things of this life. Sometimes we, we have this hot or cold mentality as Christians, and maybe we preachers are to blame for this, is that we have heaven waiting for us. That's the good news. But everything in this life is the bad news. And every joy or happiness is to be eschewed and to, to be avoided. That's not the biblical view. The wise man said, enjoy yourself. Now, he would warn the young people in chapters 11 and 12 that they're to do so with some restraint, knowing that they'll be brought into judgment, but that the things of this life are to be enjoyed. And I've learned that, and I've learned that from people who have a lot to complain about, but yet maintain a very positive outlook on life. These teachers of good have taught me what the New Testament says, what Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, verses 7. In fact, let's just turn over there. Philippians chapter 4. Because I want to emphasize a couple words in this text, and it'll be easier to do that if you're looking at the text. Philippians chapter 4. Begin in verse 6. Here's what I've learned from these teachers of good. Philippians 4 verse 6, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, shall guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, my brethren, verse 8, whatever things are true, Whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. I want to focus just a little bit there on verse 8. Whatever things are good, just, pure. What the Holy Spirit through Paul is telling us is that there are things in this life that are noble, that are just, that are pure, that are lovely, are of good report, that have some virtue. Now, are there things in this life to be avoided? Is there evil and worldliness all around us? Absolutely. But the Holy Spirit is also telling us there are good things. Think on those things. Filter through the garbage of life and find that which is good. And focus on that. And these teachers of good have taught me that. Skip down a little bit later, still in the fourth chapter of Philippians. And in verse 18. The Apostle Paul, after speaking of some of the things that he has gone through. And we would remind you of the setting of this letter, of the book of Philippians. It's one of the latter epistles that this man would write. And by the time that he writes it, he is, by those days' standards and today's, he's an old man. And he's been through a lot. In fact, he's going through a lot at this very moment. He is in prison. When he says this, Philippians 4, verse 18, Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full. Having received from Epaphroditus the thing sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing unto God. What do you need, Paul? I'm good. What can I do for you? Is there something I can help you with? Is there something that you need? I've got all I need. An old man with a lot to complain about teaches us that happiness is a choice. Another thing that I've learned from old people, these teachers of good, 
is that I too can endure hardships. You know, if you get to be in that category known as senior citizen, it's inevitable that the passage of time has also brought with it a lot of difficulties, a lot of hardships. I'm 50 years old. And I can say at this stage in my life that I've led a generally sheltered life. I haven't had a whole lot of hardship. I haven't had a whole lot of difficulty and heartache and heartbreak. But I know my time's coming. Life has taught me that. And as I look at the road that hopefully the Lord will allow me to pass by that's before me, I wonder, can I endure the hardships that will come? Will I remain faithful through those difficult times? Look over in 1 Peter chapter 4. At the language that's used there, as an encouragement to those who were going through are about to go through trials. 1 Peter chapter 4, look at verse 12. He says, Beloved, 1 Peter 4 verse 12, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when His glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. He says, don't think it's strange about the trials you're going to have to endure because everybody's going through them. Specifically in this context, he may be talking about Christian trials and the persecution of being a Christian, but even in that context, he's saying every Christian is going through that. There's some comfort in knowing that we have company, that others have gone through these trials and have been able to endure them. Skip over to chapter 5, still in 1 Peter, chapter 5, and in verse 9 he says, speaking of the devil who either is the source of many of these trials or will use these trials as an attempt to get us to lose our faith. He says this, 1 Peter 5 verse 9, Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. We've got company. And we not only have company as we're going through the trials, but we have a pathway. We have an example laid before us of others who have gone through it. And they endured it with their faith intact. And that tells me that I can do the same. And so we say a word of thanks to those, both those saints who have gone on before us and those aged saints who are enduring today. We say thank you. Thank you for showing us the way. Thank you for showing us that it can be done. Because we all ask those questions, can I endure a devastating financial loss? What will I do when my parents die? Can I handle the loss of a spouse? Or even a child? And I look up the road and I see others with white hair or no hair who have done it. And I say, I can. 
I can resist him. I can be steadfast in my faith knowing that the same sufferings have been experienced through my brethren. And I know that because I've been taught that. Another thing that these teachers have taught me is that faithfulness can last a lifetime. Well, they may teach me it's not easy. I may have even been taught that there'll be difficulties and bumps in the road. There may even be for some moments of unfaithfulness and loss. But they've taught me that endurance is possible. And that steadfastness is not just a word found in my Bible, but it's something that can actually be practiced. I've known so many Christians Men and women who have been Christians for years, for decades. And again, they've seen it all. They've seen apostasies from the faith. They've seen hardships, tribulations. They would be unable to count the number of temptations Satan has thrown at them. And they're still here. And they're setting an example for us all. And not only are they still here through all that they have faced, so many times they put the rest of us to shame. I think of a dear sister in Christ whose eyesight was failing her. And so she had a special light installed over her favorite chair. So bright that the airport called complaining. And she had a grandson find her the biggest print Bible that there was. And then her granddaughter found her powerful magnifying glass so that she could read her Bible literally one word magnified at a time. And I think faithfulness can last a lifetime. I think of old brother Sid Kurd who watched his wife die of cancer slowly until finally she breathed her last early one Wednesday afternoon. And when the saints assembled for Bible study on Wednesday night, in walked Sid. And some said, Sid, what are you doing here? Your wife just died. To which he, as he always would, gruffly replied, where else am I going to be? I can picture a classroom at the Helton Drive building in Florence. A side classroom that was set up with a remote TV monitor. Because two of our elderly members were going through cancer treatments and their doctors told them, you don't need to be around other people. The risk is too high. And so they would come to the building through a side door and go into that classroom. And still participate in worship. And I think faithfulness can last a lifetime. 
And again, I didn't come up with that myself. That's not just reading words in the Scripture, as valuable as they are. I've been taught that. I've been taught that they're not just older. They haven't just had more birthdays than the rest of us. They've seen more. They've experienced more. They've been through the battles and the struggles. And they're still here. And no wonder the Bible tells me that I'm to respect them. And to listen when they talk. And to learn from them. Because they teach us what the Hebrew writer taught us. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 12. These faithful, aged saints are the real life embodiment of Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1. That says, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses... Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. I hope it's not doing too grave of a disservice to this text to point out that although the great cloud of witnesses that the Hebrew writer is talking about here were those dead saints in chapter 11, that there's also a great cloud of witnesses that are still living. And even those who have already passed on. But that I knew personally. And they've joined this great crowd of witnesses. And they're an example to me to run this race with endurance. Because they've taught me that it's possible to live to the end with faithfulness. So Paul said to Titus, Titus, the churches you're going to be working with are going to have some good teachers. And you encourage them to be teachers of good. You tell those old men and those old women that they've got something to offer. That they can teach the young. And so I want to encourage, if you fit in that category, to be a teacher. And I want to encourage the rest of us that don't fit into that category to be willing to learn, to listen, and to look at what we're being taught by these wonderful teachers of good. Will you pray with me this morning? Our dear God and Father, we're so thankful for the many ways that you bless us for life itself, for the joy, the health, and the happiness that we get in being a part of this creation. We're thankful for the spiritual blessings, your word, your son. And we're so thankful, Father, for the many teachers that we've had that have taught us what we need to do and what we can do to be faithful to you. We're thankful for our older brothers and sisters, for the lessons and the example that they've left before us, that they've taught us that no matter what we're going through, that we can truly have the joy and the happiness that comes in being your children. That they've taught us that we too can endure the hardships that will surely come our way that whatever this life or Satan throws at us, that 
we can come through. We're so thankful that they've taught us endurance, that their faithfulness has lasted, and so can mine. Bless them, Father, and bless us as we look to them and learn from them. And help us to set that example to those who will come after us. All these things we pray through the love and the avenue of your Son. Amen.